Where should I look? Before we begin tonight's presentation, I wanted to say that we have a new. <laughs> okay, let me start over. Before we begin tonight's presentation, I wanted to say that we have a new award winner in Sierra Sage. Patty Sappingfield was just awarded the 2022 Atlas Award from the National Sierra Club. She is the founder, along with Mike Sappingfield, who's here tonight, of Sierra Sage. Patty has organized countless outings, special events, and meetings in her 30 years as a volunteer here in South Orange County. I want to personally thank her for all of her hard work and her enthusiasm for Sierra Sage. Without her volunteer efforts, we would not be here tonight. Thank you, Patty. So, <clears throat> I want to thank everyone for being here, as well as the people watching the live stream tonight. Um, we have um, a very special guest. Uh, we have all seen the devastating pictures in the media of out-of-control out of wildfires, but what we don't see are the fires that never start, start at all. Um, because of the work of our speaker, Tony Pointer, uh, who's from um, Irvine Ranch Conservancy. He and his team of volunteers are able to notice the, the warning signs on hiking trails and in open spaces, and they can um, stop fires before they even get started. Please join me in welcoming Tony to Sierra Sage tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So if you can give me just a second to, to put the mic on for those that are listening in. Do, uh, do you have a thumbs up on the audio? Fantastic. You want to throw up the first slide there? Okay, great. Welcome. I really appreciate you inviting me here this evening. A uh, little bit additional background uh, about me. I uh, started the position with Irvine Ranch Conservancy uh, in 2016. Uh, I actually started two days earlier than my start date. Uh, my director called up and said, we now have a red flag warning. Can you start early? And uh, even though I was supposed to start on Monday morning, I started Saturday. Uh, for the red flag that was uh, going to start on Sunday. And so uh, I hit the ground running. Uh, I'm not unfamiliar with wildfires. Uh, I was a reserve firefighter with Orange County Fire for 10 years or so uh, in the 90s. I worked mainly out of Station 7 in San Juan Capistrano. And since then, I have worked in IT and emergency management. And this position that I have now in managing Firewatch is probably um, the best aggregate of all my skills uh, pertaining to IT and emergency management and fire uh, than I probably have, have ever had in, in a job. So uh, again, thank you for inviting me uh, to uh, discuss wildfires with you. I'm hoping that'll go. If not, I can... Uh... See if that moves forward. I might have to escape and jump right back in because it seems to be frozen. Okay, let me start it again. You want to double check and make sure that you're online? Okay, perfect. So let's talk about wildfires in Orange County. Uh, wildfires are not a new phenomena. Uh, in fact, even with the indigenous tribes that were in the area, wildfires were a reoccurring element uh, in our environment. Uh, in my personal opinion, the tribes were probably doing a better job in managing wildfires. Uh, but 
when you look at the population density of you know, how many individuals were in the tribes versus what we have now, um, we have a significant difference in uh, how many individuals live in our wildland urban interface. Um, it probably wouldn't surprise you the different types of tasks that they were using for wildfires. Uh, they would actually set controlled burns to clear space for hunting, for farming, for security. Uh, so they actually used and control fire in a very different way uh, than what we probably manage today. The fact that we don't manage it the same way some of the original tribes managed fire is probably why we're in this predicament. Um, mainly, we pay taxes for firefighters to jump on a fire engine, rush out, and put fires out as quickly as possible. Somewhere in between um, the time frame of uh, you know 100 and 150 years uh, till now, we forgot that we actually have to manage our forests a little bit better and not just put fires out very quickly. And when we talk about the role that fire plays in our ecosystem, uh, hopefully I'll be able to convey that message to you as, uh, as we go forward today. For those of you that are here, what do you think causes wildfires in Orange County? Just throw them out. Human almost all, okay, that's very accurate. In Orange County, 96% of our fires are, can be classified down into human caused. That still leaves... Weather, lightning. lightning. Interesting in lightning, from the, Santa Barbara board, from the Santa Barbara area all the way down to San Diego, that coastal area that we live in, we have the least incidence of lightning in the continental 48 United States. And other than a couple of uh, thunderstorms that we've had just in the past five years or so, where in one night we had over 1,200 lightning strikes, uh, the couple of fires that were started, one was a structure fire that the, that the lightning actually started a, a residence on fire, and the other was ornamental vegetation in the yard of a house. So we didn't actually see any uh, fires that were started in our open space. In fact, the 10 years that I was with Orange County Fire, we had one that I responded to uh, that was a lightning strike. And by the time we got there, the rain put it out. So that incidence is not really high, but it can happen. So that can attribute another aspect. In the human cause category, uh, what are some ways that you know uh, our wildfires start? Go ahead. Power lines started out a few years ago in Orange County as about 11%. It has creeped up to about 15 to 18. It's actually probably going to bump up uh, in the next year that our electrical infrastructure are causing more and more fires within Southern California. Uh, that percentage is very different in the PG&E area, uh, as you've seen from their ignitions. And so our public utility companies have a responsibility to deliver power without starting fires. Uh, and I sit in a meeting with all of those representatives as well as fire representatives quarterly. And we talk about wildfires and what we're all doing to minimize those ignitions. So they realize that there's problems. They're trying to balance delivery versus availability of resources. Um, but it is definitely an issue um, for power lines. What are some other ways? Uh, metal, tools rocks. metal tools, striking rocks, and what else? Rocks from vehicles and other mechanical yes, so if we look at uh, tools striking rocks, uh, it is not illegal to utilize power equipment that uh, has fixed blades that can strike and set an ignition. Um, and also along our roadsides, we have a lot of different ignitions that uh, can occur from uh, catalytic converters failing, hot brake parts coming off of vehicles, uh, or just even, even if we look at the, uh, the 133 uh, Laguna Canyon Road, we about every year, about once a year, we have an overheated vehicle that always finds the one tree right next to the roadside to pull underneath because they want the shade. The vehicle starts fully involved on fire then it starts the tree on fire, then it starts the vegetation on fire, and the driver and the motorist can't understand why when the fire engine gets there, they put the vegetation out before the vehicle. 
What they don't understand is that ve that vegetation that's burning can potentially burn, you know, a couple thousand homes. Their vehicle is already a total loss, and that fire is not going anywhere once it's there. They need to get the extension and that spread. Uh, does that pretty much cover what you think uh, starts? We had honestly, we don't have a lot of areas to camp in uh, in Orange County specifically. There are only two Orange County parks that I can think of that you can actually camp. Um, there's a the state park area that has some camping, and then right outside of the Orange County border, um, you know, the the National Forest has a couple of camping spots. There's just not a lot of areas that you can camp in along the beach, basically. So we have some ignitions, but they're not a high incidence. It's actually lower than some of the other roadside or tool ignitions. You know, it, with the advent and the introduction of e-cigarettes, where they don't eject or throw away a component, that's almost gone down to none. Um, so where that used to be one of the leading causes, um, as people have been changing the technology, uh, the investigators just don't seem to be finding you know, that very often. There was one category that I don't think anybody mentioned Fireworks, yes, those are they can be unintentional unless they already know that they're you know, illegal in certain areas. Um, and about every 4th of July, we have at least one fire. Most of them are in and around the OC Parks areas um, that we have. Um, but nobody mentioned arson. arson. Well, intentional well, ignition. Right, and we'll uh, talk a little bit about that fire when we get a little bit uh, further in. But uh, arson actually is that ever-growing percentage as well. It used to be about 11 or 12 percent in Orange County. And with the last couple of fires that we've had in Orange County, that percentage has actually jumped up to, again, to 15 to 20 percent. And we'll talk about some of the ignitions that we've had uh, in Orange County. So that gives you an idea of where some of our fires are igniting from uh, in Orange County. So how Firewatch got started. Uh, a couple of back-to-back -back fires in 2006 and 2007 destroyed some of the open space restoration projects that the Irvine Ranch Conservancy had. Uh, and they approached the Orange County fire officials and a couple other partners and asked what could be done to either not have these ignitions or to give firefighters a better chance in fighting fires when they do start. And they kind of blatantly ripped off a similar program that were in some of the canyons and actually in Malibu. Uh, where they have, you know, one of the first fire watch programs, you know, given their, their threat of wildfires in their area. So, you know, we wanted something that really was able to interact with the public at trailheads and roadsides uh, and not just be remote lookouts, basically. And so this version of fire watch came about as a way to better interact with the public. Uh, that was the IRC version of uh, fire watch. After the Santiago fire and then the freeway complex fire in 2008, the uh, Orange County Board of Supervisors kind of told OC Parks, you're going to have a similar program to Irvine Ranch Conservancy. And so we had two relatively large programs within Orange County uh, with a lot of other organizations that were adding to that effort. In around uh, 2013, Irvine Ranch Conservancy was contracted by OC Parks to manage their volunteers and to manage the, you know, some other components of the Irvine Ranch open space. And they decided to combine the IRC and OC Parks Firewatch to what I currently manage as Orange County Firewatch. And we have 305 volunteers that uh, go out on the specific uh, deployment days, which we'll talk about uh, a few times, several times uh, throughout the county. When Irvine Ranch Conservancy executive team was talking to Orange County Fire Authority and some of the other fire agencies, they asked them for data points as to where the ignitions were coming from. So Orange County Fire Authority gave all the electronic data and actually pulled file boxes out of storage units 
uh, to be able to go back to the 50s, you know, when the ranger unit and the California Department of Forestry unit was actually operating in Orange County. And what they did was they plotted, and the, if you can see the little yellow dots up there, they plotted where all the ignitions were occurring in Orange County. And then they overlaid the road infrastructure and they started to see a trend that the vast majority of our fires were occurring uh, very close to road sites. That has changed over a few years because our, our electrical infrastructure is starting to age. We're having some failures and, uh, and we're having some lines come down that are starting fires. But at the time of 2007, most of our fires were occurring by roadsides. So there were a few that weren't, um, but that also gave us an indicator as to where best for our volunteers to be positioned uh, when we're actually out on deployment. So what we tend to focus on are the catastrophic wildfires. We actually have a wildfire in Orange County uh, at least once a week. At least once a week, our fire ag agencies respond to a vegetation fire. Uh, over 90% of the fires are kept to under 10 acres by our fire fighters going out there, being diligent, putting quick resources on the fire and keeping them small. So we typically deal with the catastrophic category of wildfires. Um, and again, most of those are human caused. Uh, the majority start on roadways and in around the wildland urban interface based on you know, the data that we have on the ignition. But the most destructive were on red flag warning days, Santa Ana wind days. And when we start looking at some of those statistics, you'll realize maybe why our volunteers aren't out there like this weekend um, where we had temperatures into the 90s or in the last heat wave where we had temperatures, you know, potentially almost 100, hot doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have catastrophic fires. It does influence our wildfires, but it doesn't necessarily make it a driving force for an exceptionally catastrophic fire. So as I mentioned, we took a well-known concept uh, similar to the fire lookouts, um, if you recognize the building there in the middle, uh, that's the Casper's uh, Nature Center where the ranger office is. Uh, actually on the far side on the left there uh, is a Bolero Peak uh, lookout tower that was in Orange County. Uh, that one actually eventually uh, fell apart and was abandoned uh, before they dismantled it on the peak. Um, there is actually one lookout tower in Orange County that's left. Anyone know where that lookout tower is? Within the Orange County boundary lines. Can you think of that? That's kind of a trick question. It's in California Adventure. It's a replica. We'll talk about what we use now to replace the lookout towers in Orange County, but all the counties around us still utilize lookout towers. Uh, and when we do occasionally meet with some of those organizations, they seem fascinated with the fact that we talk to visitors because they don't ever have visitors to their towers. They're in such remote locations. You know, they'll have one of them that says, well, I got a couple of visitors one season, two. You know, two is like, you know, every minute in some of our locations. Uh, Black Star Canyon, we could have 500 visitors on one day. So uh, it's a little different concept for them, but it's not designed to be exactly the same. Uh, and we'll talk about what some of those differences are. Uh, we currently manage 36 different locations throughout the Orange County parks and open space areas of Orange County. And again, uh, uh, since we incorporate Orange County parks and city of Irvine and city of Newport Beach, uh, they go from uh, Brea and Carbon Canyon, uh, all the way down to Caspers and from the open space areas along Santiago to we have areas that uh, they look down in Newport Beach open space down to the waves. Um, but there are still homes in that open space that uh, are a threat to wildfires. Our main role when we're out there are to uh, be a visual presence as uh, uh, to deter arsonists. 
Uh, the volunteers, as you can see, they wear brightly colored vests and they have vehicle magnets, not trying to trap anybody, basically as if uh, an arsonist is driving down the road. And when they're on Santiago Canyon, if they see four volunteers separated by you know, less than a mile, they might think twice about starting something along that area, knowing that someone's visually going to see it and call very quickly. And they're not going to get the result that they want when they want to start a fire. To uh, try and help prevent some of these uh, accidental ignitions and provide early detection. When we talk about accidental ignitions, uh, and, you, and someone mentioned tools creating a spark, uh, it may surprise you or not that in Orange County, we've had two ignitions for wildfires from golf clubs. And that occurred because there is a golf club with a magnesium head that if you hit the rock just the right way instead of the ball, so there's the first problem, and I'm not a golf pro, but you, I do believe the whole intent is to hit the ball. Um, when they hit a rock or something like that, it created a spark and it created a fire. And we've had two, not one, but two incidences in Orange County that have created, they, for some reason, they've all been South County, south of us. Um, but uh, yeah, two different incidents. So ignitions can happen for all different types of reasons. Most of them are unintentional. You know, uh, we weren't expecting something like that to happen, um, but uh, the, that first ignition occurred. So Firewatch is part of a larger ignition reduction strategy. We work with a long list of partners, and our volunteers walk, sit, or park near the perimeters of high-risk areas. Some of our network partners, like the Orange County Sheriff's Reserves, the Orange County Racies, and a couple of the Canyon programs, they mobile patrol in their vehicles. And part of that is, is where we have volunteers at our loca 36 locations throughout the day, we kind of have what I refer to as banker's hours. We typically deploy from 9 to 5. After 5 p.m., many of the Canyon and some of the other organizations, they take over after we're done at 5 p.m. And they go through the night, and it's a little bit safer for them to be in a vehicle and have a larger patrol area. Um, during the daytime, though, being in a fixed area, many of our volunteers can see the recurrence of a suspicious vehicle that might drive by a location four times and report it. So that's the benefit that we have uh, as to some of those locations being stationary. This is a, but a half of the list of some of the organizations and agencies that uh, participate and support our Firewatch activities. It got so long that I finally had to just add it to a second slide so that everyone uh, could potentially see. Um, one of the other organizations that actually meets in this building as well is the South Orange Amateur Radio Association. They meet uh, once a month as well, just down the hall. And uh, we actually use their repeater for amateur radio communication on those deployment days. And I'll uh, talk about that towards the end and how that helps with our communication uh, as how spread, our, spread out we are in some of our more remote locations within Orange County. So some of the reasons to prevent catastrophic wildfire, obviously within the community side, loss of life, that's one of the things that we're trying to prevent. Um, statistically speaking, in recent times, and this would be 30 plus years or so now, uh, Orange County is one of the only counties that has not had a fire-related death uh, pertaining to a wildfire. They did find a body in Peters Canyon that they deemed was deceased before the wildfire. There's not a county around us between San Diego, San Bernardino, Riverside, and LA. They all have fire-related deaths and almost seasonally. I can't tell you the reason why Orange County is different. I would hope there are a couple of things that are put together with our emergency management uh, and our messaging. Maybe the residents leave when the voluntary evacuation order is posted, or better yet, they are already gone by the time the mandatory evacuation order is issued. Could be that they're paying attention to the conditions and they're getting out early if they feel like there's a threat. Maybe they're doing proper clearance that's not occurring in counties of Southern California. I don't have a magic crystal ball as to say why we don't have deaths, but uh, it's a very different statistic when we look at the other counties around Orange County. We obviously want to minimize property damage 
air quality I'll get into uh, in the next slide just a little bit more in depth. And obviously, most of those communities that have had catastrophic wildfires, even the ones that have had fires in the past 10 years, none of them are recovered. Many of those communities will never recover to 100% of what they were before the fire. Um, just many of those individuals and businesses uh, have just moved on to other areas um, and to, uh, to set up their homes in, in other areas. So when we look at ecological reasons to prevent catastrophic wildfires, uh, we look at the loss of biodiversity, and I'll get a little bit more into that. Basically, our native vegetation takes a little bit longer to grow back after a fire, even though it's fire adapted and can grow back even stronger after some high intensity uh, and high severity fires. Our invasive weeds, like the black mustard seed, uh, grow back faster than our natives. And so the weeds take over faster and it never gives our native a natives a chance to grow back. So it's one of the things that we do in our restoration projects is after a fire goes through, we're on weed management until the natives actually get a chance in the seed bank to be able to grow and thrive and potentially choke out the weeds that might, uh, that might have that uh, little bit faster growing cycle. And uh, that leads to habitat type conversion where if though that vegetation is not managed and it's left to just grow back without somebody taking a look at it and managing that regrowth of those invasives, we start to lose our natives. The seeds just sit in the seed bank in the soil, even after a fire, and we get a whole hillside of brightly yellow colored flowers that if you don't live here, you ooh and ah during the spring when you see it, because you're not here during the summertime when it looks like matchsticks all sitting in the ground ready to be lit on fire. Our actual fire regime for Southern California and in this area is uh, we're supposed to get a high severity fire in our area every 60 to 100 years. When I show you the pictures of some of our recent fires, you'll start to see that our fire regime right now is we have a significantly sized catastrophic wildfire every seven to 10 years in the same places. Right now, the 91 corridor and Santiago Canyon and Atoll Road, um, that's about the frequency that we're having and it's like the same areas are burning over and over and over again. So, uh, that starts to throw off you know, our, our whole ec ecological system as well. This was uh, statistics put out by uh, the Forest Service and uh, the federal uh, agency, and it shows the emissions of uh, normal, uh, basically normal industry and vehicles. And uh, even if you look at uh, the 2015, uh, where it shows how, much, how many metric tons of carbon dioxide were released into the air at 22.8 versus what our normal production of, of emissions during that year from vehicles and from industry was only 1.49. And that was rated on federal land. So let me put it a little bit more broad and show you that as of... This was a 2020 statistic released in 2021. Uh, the over nine fires that we had burning during the 2020 year uh, put uh, 112 million metric tons of carbon dioxide into the air. That's the equivalent, as you can see from the automobile up there, to 24, over 24 million vehicles. Anyone know how many registered vehicles we actually had in California in 2020? I had to look it up. We only had 14.2 million registered vehicles. Now we have more vehicles that are obviously using our roadways because of out-of-state vehicles, but that means we had more smoke go in the air and put particulates in the air than all the vehicles driving our freeways all year long. And this is, if I would put any call to action towards any group that I present to, if you want good air quality, keeping wildfires small and managed is probably the best way that you can, can take care of the air quality. Yes, all the other uh, programs that we have to be able to minimize that 
um, will be successful over time. But if we continue to have wildfires in this size um, and in this capacity, whatever we do to drop those emissions is going to be completely wiped out every single year by our wildfires. And we keep having those over and over and over to where we don't have a fire season anymore. It's almost a little fatigued to hear a fire chief say, fire season is all year, wrong, all year long. Well, welcome to Southern California. So they just finally caught up to that. So I'm going to show you a quick video um, that kind of is a multimedia summary of wildfires. And if you've lived in Southern California, this will sort of be a refresher for you. So as I mentioned, it's not unusual for you to see that type of fire behavior if you've lived in Southern California any number of years. Uh, it seems like every other year this is what our fire season looks like. So let me go over a couple things, uh, basics for fire. Um, if we look at the basic fire triangle, firefighters typically try to remove one side of the fire triangle. Uh, for instance, heat, they put water on a fire and it starts to extinguish the fire. Uh, for a wildfire, they may uh, remove all the fuel, the vegetation down to bare mineral earth, which if the fire doesn't have the fuel to consume, then the fire will eventually go out. So that's the goal is to remove one of those sides of the fire triangle. Some of the basics that influence wildfires in Southern California are fuel, the weather, and topography. And we'll touch on uh, each of those topics. So our fuel in Southern California, specifically in Orange County, we don't have big forests. We don't have big timber trees. In fact, unless you go to the South Main Divide on the Cleveland National Forest, we have very few areas that have big tree stands, basically. Yes, we plant trees in some of the communities. You drive down Irvine, you can see any kind of pine, eucalyptus that you want to, but they were all planted. So we don't typically have natural forests in the area. What we do have are a combination of light grasses that are native, uh, and 
a lot of scrub and chaparral, which are medium, you know, uh, rated fuels in size and in burning capability. But uh, we don't have a lot of oaks and pines. We have natural coastal and canyon oaks. Um, we have some evergreen tree stands on the Orange County border with the Cleveland. Uh, and we have uh, some Ducati Cypress, very unique. We have uh, the northernmost uh, stand of Ducati Cypress left. You know, it's the last of that, uh, that species in the, in the area. Um, but on top of that, we have a lot of non-native vegetation. All the stuff that was planted here on purpose, the stuff that was brought here not on purpose, but quite accidentally, that they didn't think was going to be a problem, um, but uh, now seems to be an invasive issue. Uh, in We talked about how it's replacing some of our uh, native vegetation. Uh, the other consideration, weather, there's not a lot we can do about wind. Wind is a force that pushes fire in whatever direction it's coming from. Uh, again, our temperature, it can be very hot or it can be a nice, cool 65 degrees in December and we could still have a catastrophic wildfire. Uh, and then last, the moisture. Uh, when we talk about the moisture in the air, we typically have more wildfires when our humidity, um, our relative humidity is way down in the single digits, below 15%. Um, so when our humidity, the way it's been in our monsoonal uh, patterns that we've had, where it's 40 and 50 percent, it actually allows the vegetation to retain moisture and it makes it a little bit more difficult to start fires. Unless you're in the second year of a drought, you know, imagine when we're in our seventh year and that's how we typically work. You know, we can go back and look where we've had five to seven years of drought periods, one or two wet years, and then we go back to the five to seven years, depending upon how the cycle is going to work in the area. Um, so that fuel moisture really plays a, a role in whether the vegetation is receptive. And I'll show you the, the actual fuel moisture statistic last month that Orange County Fire uh, just recently took. So just a quick Re, uh, a brief as to what a Santa Ana wind is and where it comes from. Uh, we get a high in the Great Basin. It uh, allows wind to go over our deserts, which preheats those winds. When it gets to our local mountains, it compresses the wind and speeds it and accelerates it through our local mountains. And depending upon its strength, may go completely through our bowl or our basin of the inland weather zone. And if it's strong enough, it'll get all the way out to the coastal weather zone. And depending on whether there's a low sitting out off of the coast, uh, we'll also make the determination as to uh, whether it's funneling and that strength. So uh, this is our typical pattern that we can see anywhere from uh, 20 to 25 incidents uh, during a Santa Ana wind season. Not all of them escalate to the criteria of a red flag warning. Uh, but I'll talk about that in a second. And then the last component that influences a wildfire, like it said in the video, is slope. Fire does burn faster uphill because it preheats the fuel and the gases allow for easier combustion for it to travel. So most firefighters try to catch the fire on the downhill side because it's burning a little bit slower. And anytime you put two slopes together, you have a canyon that will accelerate the fire potential in the area. And then a couple of other topographical areas that are dangerous for firefighters that help spread uh, wildfires are those saddles and ridges, the ridge lines where uh, all the news copters like to hang out so they can see the 30, 50 foot flame lengths uh, for the evening news. So what comprises a red flag warning? It starts with a fire weather watch issued by the National Weather Service. If you are someone that wants to be aware of the conditions, look for that in the Orange County area. We have three weather zones and typically it will encompass at least the mountain and the inland weather zone. It is very possible for Riverside in LA to have a red flag warning and not Orange County based on the strength of that high and the winds coming in uh, from, uh, from the, the northeast, basically, is where it typically starts, the north and, and the northeast. When they, uh, it gets closer to the time frame where we're going to have the, the winds, they issue that red flag warning. They typically try to reach three main criteria, a temperature of greater than 75 degrees, a sustained wind average greater than or equal to 25 miles an hour, and the relative humidity is lower than 15%. 
they try to meet, meet that threshold. But I'll tell you, I have volunteers that go out in December to Santa Ana Wind uh, Red Flag Warning Days, and they have to put a light jacket on underneath their vest because it's so chilly, um, and it doesn't quite meet 75 degrees. It's 65 to 70 degrees, but it's so windy, they could have 40, 50 mile an hour wind gusts uh, at some of the locations that they're at. Uh, that typically entails that that red flag warning, those criteria are gonna be met for a six hour period or more. That allows our fire agencies to staff up and allows other organizations and agencies to be aware as to what's happening. Uh, and then the National Weather Service makes the uh, determination of whether they're gonna extend or cancel based on uh, the timing that they've already given. They make the call, the fire department doesn't get any choice in how long it's actually going to last. But that's kind of good because it allows a third party to determine the, the most severe uh, extreme fire danger of the area. So we can have very different looking counties and weather zones throughout the state at any given time. Uh, some areas might be in a fire weather watch while others might be in a red flag warning. The state is so large, it's so diverse, you know, in the vegetation and the conditions of weather that we have that uh, not any one single area looks the same on any single day. I mentioned the three weather zones. We have the mountain, the intermediate, and the coastal. Um, our fire watch program was uh, one of the uh, impetus of having the coastal weather zone actually uh, um, put into effect. We were having volunteers go out in, in some of those areas that said the th criteria was gonna meet those three criteria. They were not seeing the winds or the temperature. We asked the National Weather Service to evaluate some of the readings that they have. And they said, sure enough, that, that particular stretch of Orange County was, the weather was very different than the other two areas. So they established a new weather zone uh, to be a little bit more informative. So our seasonal outlook of what's coming up. Uh, basically, we're supposed to have near to above normal monsoonal showers through mid-September. Well, they didn't really come, you know, and we didn't get very much rain. Uh, the temperatures are supposed to be well above normal. Well, we've had the last couple of heat waves. Rainfall well below normal. So, uh, as I saw, basically through October, we weren't supposed to get any more rain in October. Well, fingers crossed for November, but uh, probably not. And then uh, we're supposed to have a normal amount of Santa Ana wind events uh, October through December. So everything's supposed to be normal other than the things that are below normal. <laughs> this is what our vegetation moisture looks like. The blue line that stops um, and the top one is uh, the Black Star area. You can see the fuel moisture. It's not quite as low as it was last year, but it'll probably get lower to where our vegetation will be drier than it was last year. And that's the past few years. So our current state of what the vegetation is at, the only reason it has the moisture right now that it does is because we've had that higher uh, humidity and it hasn't dried out the vegetation uh, as in the other years. Uh, and the one on the bottom is the same as well. It's very low uh, moisture in the vegetation, so the fuels are obviously receptive to burn. Uh, we've seen that in just some of the fires in the nearby uh, uh, counties, like in Riverside, the Fairview fire. So why fire watch is needed? As a quick summary, you can see between 2006 and 2012, over 70,000 acres burned, almost 250 structures burned, 176 structures damaged, over 200 injuries. There's that zero death rate that we have, over 17,500 homes evacuated at a cost of over $31 million. I typically get the question, why is it so expensive to fight fires? Well, one of the tools in the firefighter toolbox now are aerial resources, helicopters and our bombers that can come in and lay FOS check, and that's the, our most expensive tool. But if you probably ask any ground firefighter, hey, would you rather fight fire without the air resources? I don't think a single one would say, no, no, we got this. Just realize the fires don't get put out unless the firefighters on the ground put them out. The aerial resources slow the fire down. Even when you see that water dropping helicopter put the load of water on, that there is still fire down there until the ground firefighters put it out and we put a line completely around it, they don't consider it contained or extinguished. Uh, so it's a, usually a difficult prospect. 
Some of the fires that we had after that period, we had the Canyon Fire um, in September, over 2,600 acres burned and six homes damaged. That started off of Cole Canyon on the 91, was burning towards Orange County. We had a late afternoon wind shift, and in a typical 24-hour period, it's not uncommon for Orange County to have five wind shifts in 24 hours. That late afternoon wind shift actually pushed the fire back towards Riverside, and all six of those damaged homes were on the Riverside side. On the final day of the fire, or the day before, the day after the fire was considered contained, uh, we had a red flag warning event, and the Canyon Two fire ignited from an ember in one of the chaparral along Gypsum and uh, and the 91 where we ended up having another 9,000 acres burned and 25 homes destroyed. The Canyon Fire was started by a road flare that a Caltrans crew was using. That falls in a human cause. Because it's a reignition of an ember from a human caused wildfire, Canyon 2 would be considered human cause as well. The fire wouldn't be there if it weren't for the Caltrans road crew with the, road crew with the flares. As an afterthought, at least Caltrans can learn. They no longer use road flares on red flag warning days. They approach our organization. We help them rewrite some of their parameters. And Orange County parameters are now being shared throughout the whole state. Why it took a major change or a fire for them to realize to not use lit road flares on a windy day, I don't know. But it shows that they're making the effort, I guess. Um, here's an example of the Canyon 2 fire and the winds. You can see from the deck gun turret from the firefighter. Um, this is in Foothill Ranch. This isn't actually near the fire line. This is over a mile away. So an ember flew through the air to someone's residence in Foothill Ranch, where up to that point, most of them didn't realize they lived in the wildland urban interface. Their ornamental vegetation caught on fire, palm tree. Only thing that burns better than a palm tree is a matchstick basically, and um, they couldn't figure out why their homes were starting on fire on that same day. So just something to keep in mind, even if the fire seems like it's not that close. Uh, we did have the Aliso Viejo fire. That was the fire started by the, the Ute that was out in the canyon um, playing with uh, incendiary objects. They didn't prosecute, um, but that was 175 acres, and that was in June of 2018. The Holy Fire was just after that. That was an arson still in prosecution phase, over 23,000 acres, and that's the one that burned a lot of acreage through uh, Holy Jim and up into the Cleveland National Forest. More recently, we had the Silverado fire in October of 2020. This was from an infrastructure power line that fell down and lit the vegetation on fire. Over 12,000 acres burned, five structures damaged, nine structures da destroyed, sorry, reverse that, five structures destroyed and nine structures damaged. Um, and then the bonfire was caused by a malfunctioning generator from a resident who had their power shut down because of the PSPS. They wanted to shut down the line so they wouldn't have another fire. The resident incorrectly used their generator. It caught on fire and we burned another 6,000 acres. Both human caused, right? I think we can all agree that that would be a human cause. And then most recently, the coastal fire in May of 2022, again, shows that it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a Santa Ana wind time or summertime, because uh, in spring, we had 200 acres that burned, 20 homes destroyed, 12 homes damaged, and a little bit before that, the Emerald Fire, you can even see the smoke blowing offshore. So uh, it started in the morning time before the sun came up, and it was an onshore wind, and late afternoon it switched to an offshore wind, and it burned back on itself. They were concerned it was going to get back into the homes, um, but by then they had a good amount of lines up at that time. So uh, that's our most recent, and these were all fuel and topography driven. Wind and weather were not necessarily a factor between these two fires, other than um, the wind shift for both of those. Um, I particularly like that coastal fire uh, shot because it kind of shows those individuals standing there had no idea that they were in danger because at that time that picture was taken they were already three wind shifts in and in fact the units that went up for structure protection 
were in a different neighborhood where they thought the wind was blowing at the time, the wind shifted and it burned homes that didn't have fire engines in front of it because of that wind shift. That's how quickly it shifted. So we have a lot of external influences. Yes. Uh, the Emerald Fire was that it was a power line infrastructure. They weren't sure whether it might have potentially been uh, a homeless encampment, but they did determine that that was electrical infrastructure, as was the Coastal Fire. That was electrical infrastructure as well. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's one of our high tension power lines. It can be anything that's energized all the way down to the end user, which is why, particularly in some of these areas, uh, there's the big push to underground the lines. So, and they can do that. They can only do that based on the resources. Um, and apparently only one company in Canada um, provides certain equipment that they can do for some of that. So uh, what our Firewatch training does, uh, we provide fire and smoke spotting for our volunteers. We give them the tools on how to size up a wildfire so they can give an estimate on the size, where it's gonna burn, give firefighters a baseline because it's gonna change by the time they get there anyways, uh, to be able to know what they might be facing and if they need to ask for more resources on the way. Uh, we give them a little bit of wildland fire behavior training so that they can describe that fire. We focus and emphasize personal safety as a huge component. Their safety is more important than anything. They don't have to worry about evacuations. They're there to observe and report and evacuate if necessary. Uh, and then do a lot of public interaction. I mentioned that we use amateur radio communications. Some of our areas, they're so remote, even at the Black Star Gate, that there's no cell phone signal there. And if we had an emergency, uh, we've been using, you know, ever since 2014, the amateur radio backbone on those days um, where we don't have cell signals, we can communicate over amateur radio through the repeater on Santiago Peak in order to actually be able to have communication. So it works very well to combine the cell phone that most of our volunteers have, and then we have about 52 uh, amateur radio volunteers that they go out to those locations that uh, don't typically have a cell signal. We actually open up an operations center when we deploy volunteers. When we have 36 locations and volunteers change locations or we have a shift change every two hours, sometimes with two volunteers at uh, every location, um, we need to try to keep track of them. So we open up uh, an operations center um, and we track what's happening. Um, and as you can see in the foreground, we also use some new technology. I mentioned that we don't use fire lookouts anymore but we uh, actually use something called virtual fire tower. The public utilities have placed cameras throughout five different states. And in our area, we have about 44 different cameras that can read the wording on a ball cap five miles away. Our volunteers monitor these camera feeds instead of going out to those locations. Um, some of them take their laptops into their living room, they plug them into their big screen TVs and they watch four cameras in big widescreen view. Um, and two years ago, we had eight reports for fires, four of them in person, four of them electronically, and they were all fires that were in and around the Orange County area. So this is a very successful program for us uh, and for our volunteers to staff these uh, camera views. Uh, here's an example as to where those are placed. You can see they're in the open space area. Some of them are stationary, some of them rotate. Um, they have a mixture based on the necessity to uh, what the fire agencies and the public utilities need to see what's happening in the area. These are all publicly accessible cameras. So you can go to Alert Wildfire and you too can see the feed on those days um, as to what's there. There's different types of views. If you wanna see the tile view with a bunch of different cameras, there's a website for that. There, I just took this screenshot two days ago. Um, this was a fire on Camp Pendleton um, that ended up being uh, about 10 acres. And uh, it was actually, you can see the red lines on the map where that camera was pointing to that fire. And it actually shows in that view shed. And we actually use artificial intelligence to say, hey, there may be a fire on this camera. And then a person goes to verify the fire because sometimes it's dust, sometimes it's a cloud. The computer's not smart enough yet to be that accurate, um, but that tells us when there's smoke in the viewshed of that camera uh, and it helps our volunteers in how they're spotting 
Um, but that's one of the locations of where you can see those cameras. And then for our intelligence, we use other websites to be able to see the fires in and around the area. Fires in Riverside on a San Ana wind day become fires in Orange County within a very few hours. So we keep and monitor uh, what's happening in those areas. This is one of the screenshots from the camera up on Santiago Peak when uh, one of the Fozcheck bombers was laying in line to protect that uh, radio infrastructure up there. I kind of like some of the gentler pictures. This is snow when it was uh, raining and snowing out on Pleasance Peak. This is Orange County. So you can't say, no one can say we don't get snow in Orange County. Granted, it's on top of the mountain range. That's still Orange County area. It's kind of nice to see something a little different rather than the same old weather. Um, and then that's uh, the volunteers while they're on deployment. I know I probably went over time. I apologize for that. But um, if there's no questions, if there, yes, go ahead. So do you interact with other counties in California? So... This is such a new concept, you know, other than in Malibu and a couple other cities. Uh, yes, we interact with some organizations that are on the Riverside side, San Diego, and in LA. Yes, neighboring counties. Yes. Right. So um, have they changed to be under fire, or is this sort of a mutual agency kind of thing for Orange County? Or Orange County is all mutual aid okay. because we actually, I train our, our sheriff's reserves and our Orange County races under the sheriff's department to do the same tasking. They just do it in a vehicle where we do it stationary, and we all look for the same things. Okay. Other than the fact that our incidence of arson and the possibility of coming across an arson is so low, that they could actually prevent a wildfire by seeing a broken down vehicle overheating, um, more so than trying to focus on trying to find that one person that's gonna light a fire on the side of a road, because it just doesn't happen very often. And when you're doing your volunteers and your command center, that's under sort of an instant command system set up? Yes, yes, I, I, since I come from the incident command, system with fire and emergency management. I felt it was easiest. Most of our amateur radio operators already knew ICS, so it was just easier to implement that. And many of our Firewatch volunteers are also community emergency response team volunteers in their own cities. So in trying to utilize that same commonality in ICS, it makes it easier for those volunteers to come in and work in the operations center and then as well. No, there, there are always areas. In fact, until they added a couple more cameras in Laguna Beach area, we had large holes that we couldn't see what was going on. And actually, if you saw that map, um, I would contend that we have a hole um, in the, the bowl, that intermediate weather zone. I'd like to have a camera at the new fire museum or at Irvine Spectrum that points out because we can't see anything on the inside of those foothills if it starts to be able to go up and into those areas. We can see everything from the open space down. Fires don't always start that way. So that's the next location that I'm encouraging is for us to have something that we can look out to be able to see because fires start in some of those areas along the roadsides. Right, right. So, so that's why. How do you train someone to be comfortable with the fact that you decide to go hiking and all of a sudden you're like, well, this is fascinating and tell me everything? Right. So that's a. Typically try to put two people at every location instead of just one. And I encourage them to have an, their own version of an elevator speech ready to go. So if somebody asks a question, because let's be honest, most of our visitors that are going to trailheads, they're there to hike, they're there to bike, they're there to recreate. They're not necessarily there to chat with the Firewatch person. <laughs> so I say, make it short, 20, 30 seconds, explain what you're doing, explain that if they see something to call 911 or let you know. 
Um, and if they want more in-depth information, I give them handouts. They all have my business card, you know, uh, so, so that we encourage them if somebody wants more information then to expand that um, without getting, you know, so in-depth. But that's also why we put two people, <laughs> just in case. Yes, sir. So that's one of the things that they're studying now is the effects of wildfire smoke. Uh, just within the past two years, Cal DIR now requires employees that if there's smoke in an area, you know, at PM 2.5 level for a certain amount of time, we have to put N95 masks, uh, offer N95 masks to our staff. Um, and then they also put out public health warnings for those individuals. Uh, it is becoming more and more a problem for those individuals. I wouldn't even say that are just sensitive. It's not healthy, given how we see our current firefighters after 20, 30 years in the field, to just breathe in that smoke day after day after day. Um, even though it is mainly our vegetation, there are items that we manufacture that have carcinogens in that smoke and naturally occurring carcinogens. So that's why uh, the AQMD tries to make sure that uh, they share the pattern of where the wind is going, what the air quality measurements are for the area. What the real challenge is, is how to properly message that. Does that get messaged through your healthcare agencies? Does that get messaged to only the people that are sensitive or concerned about that? I kind of think of it as it's similar to letting people know when we have the red flag warning, you know, when we have you know, police activity in a certain area, it affects the overall health of everybody. Um, but we have so much messaging that's gone out over the past two years, people are fatigued and they're no longer listening. So it might just be time for a little re-education, re-upping on that. But you make a very good point that the health aspect is, is a huge contributing factor as well. Any other questions? Thanks again. Very appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, allow me to uh, present for you. And uh, if that's it, you can ask me afterwards. Anything you need me to do to turn that off, or you're good? Okay, I'll just. Thank you, Tony. This is so illuminating. I really appreciate speak, that you came to speak to Sierra Sage. Um, in November, we will have another presentation here. Um, it's going to be about 30 by 30, which is the with four different speakers who are working on that um, effort with the Sierra Club. So I hope that on, uh, it's November? November 15th. <laughs> 30 by 30 is the effort to make 30% 30, 30 of um, land in the U.S. Pro, uh, public. That's, that's as much as I know. You're going to find out from the people that are the experts. 